Well, thank you guys for being here this evening, and thanks for kind of being patient with a little bit of a different format, but we'll get it figured out here. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let me tune up real fast here. All right, let's go over to number 60. I think we can at least get through that one here tonight. And then if, uh, if you do have a favorite, as long as they're easy chords, and I know it, we can sing that too. We can do a couple few. And then we'll look at our Bible study together tonight. It is well with my soul. Not too bad for just a couple of few of us. Anybody else have a favorite that you'd like to try tonight? Ooh, how about it? What is it? Hmm. Can you can you lead it? <laughs> I don't even know if I know this one. Trust his words. We'll skip that one, Chuck. Sorry. If you have another favorite. It is. Let's try, um, <laughs> let's try a 111, near or still near. <laughs> oh, perfect. You're going to request that one. That one counts as, as Terry's pick. Thank you. 
first and nearer, now or to be thine. Sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp and its pride, give me by Jesus, my Lord crucified. Give me by Jesus, my Lord crucified. Just like it. Just like it. You can do it. Let's see. Do one more. Maybe. Yes. It's actually the one I was looking for. So, boy, we're on the same wavelength tonight. Perfect. Old Rugged Cross. Number 90. Oh, let's get the right key here. Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my throne. At last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean. Someday for a crown To the old rugged cross I will ever be true Its shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday To my home far away Where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Let's take our Bibles tonight. We'll turn over and do a Bible study in 1 Timothy in the second chapter. And uh, trust that you'll glean some truths from it. And uh, ha I don't have extensive notes on the PowerPoint, but I do have extensive notes. So hopefully that'll <laughs> translate okay and uh, you can track with us. But 1 Timothy and uh, the second chapter. Um, we're going to pick up, I guess, for here in uh, verse 8. And uh, let's pray, and then we'll jump in tonight. Father, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here, to sing together. Uh, Lord, we affirm the promise that you say, where there two or three are gathered in your name, that you are in the midst. And so we thank you for this opportunity to worship as a church together. Lord, for many tonight that are um, 
sick or just not feeling well or uh, needing some extra rest, I pray, God, for your blessing upon them. Um, I pray for your strength for them. And uh, Lord, even as several are um, out of town with different things this weekend, I just pray for safety um, as they travel back in this next week. And Lord, uh, for those of us that are here this evening, I just pray that as we look through this passage together, um, that it would be helpful to us. And uh, Lord, as it is in some ways perhaps a sensitive topic and looking at um, ladies and their role in the church, I pray God that you would help me to be uh, gentle and gracious with the topic. Lord, that you would lead me by your spirit. Um, and Lord, uh, let me well represent what your scriptures teach. And Lord, um, I'll thank you and praise you for that tonight. Uh, guide us now in our thinking and in our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 8, uh, Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, uh, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I want to set really quick the context here of this passage. Um, he says in uh, verse uh, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications and prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. So the context is kind of prayer here. And he's going to circle back to that that we just read in verse 8 and address specifically men praying in the church. And what is the kind of the motive of all of that prayer? Um, well, we're going to pray first for um, our authorities, for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. That way we can um, have the, the freedom to, uh, to worship here, the freedom to meet together, to gather together. Um, and I don't want to overuse it, but um, I did just read that book on, on the Chinese church and just how they cherish times together as a church, and it's clandestine, it's not typically out in the open. Um, in China, the, the communist church, if you will, is the three-self church, and uh, if a pastor registers with the three-self church, he um, accepts upon himself all kinds of different regulations and stipulations concerning when he can meet and how he preaches and what all they do in the church, and the government has their hand upon that. And um, I'm thankful that though perhaps I've preached messages that maybe aren't popular in our community, I've never gotten a call from a government official, not once in my ministry, that said, hey, wait a second, pal, you need to rephrase that. <laughs> and we enjoy incredible freedom here to meet together and to worship together. And um, here in the context of this, he says, let's keep praying that that is the case, that we're able to go on and, and meet together. And especially in the um, the Roman Empire. Not all of that was always easy to navigate. So this was something that was important for them to pray for. Uh, why pray for it? Next three verses. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And sometimes we remember that verse, but we don't remember it's in the context of what? Praying for government officials. Uh, God's heart is that they would be saved. And so there's this kind of evangelistic prayer meeting. Uh, there's one God, one mediator between God and man, that man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereof I am ordained to preach and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not a teacher uh, of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And so because God's heart is for uh, men in leadership and those in leadership to be saved, uh, we are to pray that we might um, have a, 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 a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And so he's honing in here, and he's going to set this context now, not just evangelistic prayer, but specifically directed towards encouragement for men in verse 8. I will therefore, um, and I'm going to deviate, I'm not sure which translation you're, you're working with tonight, but I'm going to deviate and read some of kind of my own translation work here with the decisions that I've made in the text. I want, therefore, that men in every place, lifting up holy hands, um, men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and dispute. It's interesting that um, it, the phrase, in every place, um, it appears four different times in Paul's writings. You see it in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, and I uh, see it a couple times in those passages, and then First, First Thessalonians chapter 1. And all four times he refers to an official assembly of the church. And so this is 
I think from this point on, it's very clear that this is talking about in the context of a church worship service. And so he says, first of all, for the men, uh, because of the, the priority and because of the purpose and because of the reasons that I've just given you for prayer, um, you know, I want therefore men in every place of worship, if you will, inferred, to pray. And he describes this prayer, lifting up holy hands without anger and dispute. Now, um, this has been lost uh, pretty much in our culture, but he was speaking at a time to 1 Timothy. This is written to uh, 1 Timothy at this time, probably the pastor of Ephesus. And so this is essentially, though it's directly to Timothy, um, it's for the Ephesian church. And re remember, the early church, they didn't have necessarily a, a whole New Testament assembled. Okay, they had certain letters, right? But a lot of what they were looking at was the Old Testament and the teaching of the apostles. And so a lot of what they brought with them into the New Testament church was um, their Old Testament context. And uh, all through the Old Testament, you see different hints that this was a common Old Testament practice uh, as far as how the Jews approached the Lord in prayer. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And so this has seemed to be a posture of prayer, especially for the Jews. Um, 2 Corinthians, or Chronicles 6.13, For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold of five cubits long and five cubits broad, three cubits high, and set it in the midst of the court, and upon it he stood, and he kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. So it's interesting, here he's kneeling, but he still has his head spread, hands spread forth towards heaven. Ezra 9.5, And at the evening sacrifice I rose up from my heaviness, and having ripped my garment and mantle, I fell upon my knees, there's Ezra's testimony, and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, signifying a time of prayer. And um, first, uh, uh, Psalm 141, verse 2, uh, Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And so, uh, here he's encouraging uh, specifically uh, the men of the church in, in spiritual leadership there um, to be faithful uh, to pray within the context of the worship service. And that's important that we keep that emphasis there. Um, and typically you think, well, why do we usually in a service, if we're beginning, we're ending, why do we ask men to uh, lead in prayer? And uh, well, verses such as this, that they would have uh, that spiritual leadership, and it defines that in a couple different ways. Holy hands has an idea of an internal purity, um, that they're coming in right with the Lord, ready to have uh, that leadership, and then without wrath, uh, not angry, and, uh, or, or disputing, okay? So there's a sense of unity there. Um, um, I've often said that it's healthy to continue to pray with one another, because it is difficult to pray with someone that you're not right with. Um, and that's maybe anecdotal, but it's true. And so prayer unifies us as we come together and pray together. Um, and so having that spirit of unity um, as, uh, as men are, um, and elders and different ones are leading in the, the spiritual uh, worship there within the church context. And then um, the rest of the passage really has to do with encouragement um, for ladies. And each time I approach a text like this, um, I never really gravitate to a text like this because um, a lady I are not, and so I haven't had that um, experience in life, and so I want to be kind, I want to be gracious with this, but uh, this text was not chosen by me in the, the context of schooling. It was picked for me, and it was said, go figure this <laughs> out, and so I'm glad for the exercise, and I trust it'll be a help to you um, tonight. Uh, before dealing with how Paul is encouraging Timothy towards encouraging ladies in the church, I think it's important to consider what we know about uh, ladies in general in the early church. What are some hints that we get about that? Uh, I mean, is there just kind of a, a generalization or is there uh, some different demographics? It's interesting, in Philippi, Acts chapter 16, verse 15, it says, and when she was baptized, this is Lydia, and her household, she besought us, saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful, Lord, 
come into my house and abide there, and she constrained us. And so it's interesting if you study a little bit about the life of Lydia um, and what the hints are given there in Acts in the 16th chapter, you find out that she's a successful businesswoman in a, Ro- in a Roman context. Probably a very, very rare thing. And so um, the, typically, you know, in that, in that Roman world, if you owned a business, you were a man, there were, weren't a lot of ladies that really climbed the ranks, if you will, of society. And so here, Lydia, as a seller of purple, as a very successful business owner, and as having a home um, that she invites not just Paul, but several of his colleagues in to board and to stay. Um, probably a very wealthy lady. Um, probably someone that, uh, you know, kind of knows how to get things done. And if you look at the Greek in that passage, you know, at first Paul kind of says, you know, no, that's okay. And she says, no, listen, you're coming to my house. <laughs> and so you get the idea of the type of lady uh, that, that Lydia was. And, and she had accepted Christ. And so not that all ladies were just like her, but we're just giving a for instance, right? Um, if you look at Thessalonica, Acts chapter 17 and verse 4, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And then it says this curious phrase, and of the chief women, not a few. And so while we get hints from the Roman culture that it was a predominantly uh, maybe male-driven society, uh, there were perhaps, at least in Thessalonica, um, some ladies here that were at the very least known as what our text refers to as chief women in the community that they did have some type of leadership or have some type of affluency in that community. And so they're coming to Christ. In Berea, Acts chapter 17, verse 12, therefore many of them believed also honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. So um, these were, um, if you will, uh, while we have examples of of those that maybe lived a, um, you know, uh, the lifestyle of, for instance, a harlot or um, were of the lower echelons of society, uh, these seem to say, hey, these are, these are affluent homes, and you have men and women that are coming to Christ. Uh, they have means, and uh, we know that um, in some churches in Macedonia, there was great poverty. We understand that from passages in 2 Corinthians, but apparently there were people that, that did have money, and uh, they had means. And so we're seeing some of that backdrop here, I think, as we approach um, this passage. And so verses uh, 9 through 10, what is Paul going to encourage here? Um, and, and first, he's going to address appearance and attitudes in worship. He says, likewise, uh, I also want the women to adorn themselves in appropriate clothing with modesty and self-control, not in braided hair and gold jewelry or pearls or expensive clothing, but with good deeds, what is proper for women who profess godliness. Now, a couple things. This is an Ephesus, and one, this is just kind of a side note, and I haven't done a kind of a deep dive into this. I think there's some other resources that I could look at, but in the Ephesian church, some of these styles that he addresses, we're going to kind of break this down a little bit. Quite frankly, they could have been associated with the local temple prostitutes. If you remember um, Ephesus, it had a great temple to Diana. She was the, the Roman god of fer- fertility, and there was a lot of wickedness that happened in that uh, temple. And so um, there's some direct associations there. And so he's saying, hey, there should be a distinction, especially when you come in for a worship service. You don't want to associate with those type of things. Um, Now, before we go too far, um, let's just kind of clear the air, right? Because the scripture does make, I believe, er every allowance for ladies to wear uh, nice clothing. In fact, if you look back in Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman, how does it describe her? It says that her clothing is fine linen and purple, okay? And if you know much about purple, Okay, what was that? That was, that was some spiffy duds, okay? That was, that was really, really nice. And, um, you know, you look at Proverbs 31, and you see actually a very, very hardworking, industrious individual that provides very, very well for her home. Um, and that's part of the virtuous woman picture that we get. 
Um, I don't believe that this was um, Paul's plea for women to make themselves unattractive, um, but it was an exhortation, if you will, to reject, um, if we want to put it this way, the world's yardstick for measuring beauty and instead adopt heaven's standard. Um, and, and, and that really should be the approach of women who profess uh, to worship the Lord and are coming to worship the Lord. It's interesting that First Peter has kind of a parallel passage. And um, again, Peter is uh, addressing probably those churches that are scattered abroad um, in the Galatian region, uh, Asia Minor. And so he's uh, confronting some of these same things. And so the hints that you get from this passage is this really is directed towards, um, in many ways, ladies that are, that are very affluent, that, that, that have means, um, and that type of thing. In 1 Peter 3.3, 3, he says, "...whose adorning, let it not be that of the outward adorning of the plating of the hair and the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel." In other words, there's not an emphasis on the external, it's an emphasis on the internal. Um, again, this passage in 1 Peter, it references the, the braided hair, um, the idea here is, is, is hairstyles. It's not necessarily that, boy, if you ever come into church in braids, I'm going to call you out like, don't you know what First Peter and First Timothy say? Okay, no, it's making it. Been indifferent uh, to their hair. Um, and and uh, real quick, let's just revisit that word. It says, Likewise, I also want the women to adorn themselves. And the word is cosme, cosmain. And it, it almost sounds like cosmos. And if you're familiar with the Greek language, that's what we would get our, our term world. Okay. And the, the idea of that root word for world is not just like the earth. It's the idea of a system. Okay. So this whole world that we live in, there's a lot of what? organization in the context that we live in. What is one of the critiques of America is that we're just too busy because you wake up in the moment, morning and every minute of your day is accounted for. There's a lot of organization there, right? And so um, when he says that, um, likewise also I want the women to adorn themselves, he's saying I want the ladies to set themselves in order, <laughs> that they should be organized and put together. Um, and so uh, he's, not, he's not saying, hey, don't worry about how you look or anything like that. Um, that, that use of that, that infinitive there kind of precludes that. Um, but he is saying that some hairstyles of the day that women would resort to in order to call attention to their wealth or their personal beauty um, were inappropriate for the worship service. And apparently many times... Um, women would weave gold or pearls through their hair in really just kind of this gaudy, ostentatious, ostentatious manner um, to, to really draw undue attention to themselves. And so um, he's kind of keeping all of this, if you will, in balance. In other words, this is, you've been, you've been saved from, and remember, they've been saved from what? A pagan culture. And so if they're uh, people of means and they're used to going to a public forum, a public venue, what was the expectation? Well, this is how we've always done it. And so this is not the focus of a worship service. So he's keeping all of that in balance. Um, I don't know that there's anything wrong with wearing jewelry. Um, you look at other passages and it keeps this passages like this in balance. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be jo joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. And this is put in a very positive light. And so, and here God, uh, the prophet is comparing, in a sense, our salvation with just the beauty of someone um, in, in wearing jewelry and so forth. But what is the focus of that? And especially as we come into a worship service, ultimately it's the idea of where is the heart? Um, where is um, the individual in their heart before the Lord? And so verse 10, um, it's not the emphasis on, you know, a, a gaudy hairdo or all of this, you know, gaudy jewelry or different things or in really expensive clothing, 
but with good deeds, what is proper for women who profess godliness. It's about the heart, the modesty, and the self-control. And so 1 Samuel 16, 7 speaks to this. But the Lord said unto Samuel, when talking about David, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so the emphasis here is on the internal, um, as, as said against the external. And then uh, verses 11 through 12, not just in appearance, but also in their attitudes, um, how they approach uh, the worship service. It says this, a woman in quietness must learn with all submission, um, but I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to be in quietness. Okay, now a couple things here. One, again, this is the church worship service. Okay, um, I, it's interesting. Um, I'll do a little quick aside here. When you have a denomination, and I referenced this this morning, but that begins to um, dabble in doubting the inerrancy of the scripture, okay, <laughs> that we can't trust all of God's word. Do you know one of the, and this is, there is a correlation here, and I, this would be an interesting study to do through history, but you see this. They, they may be um, orthodox in the sense that, you know, maybe they're not everything like we are, but they, they affirm that the scripture is true, right? When that starts to go away, do you know one of the things that you start to see? You'll typically start to see first um, uh, women ministers, women clergy. And we're, when you see that trickle out, especially now in our day, eventually what do you'll see? You'll see the LGBTQ enter their church, okay? Because they're undermining passages like this. And they say, well, you know, I just don't know if that's really what Paul meant, and, and it is because he's talking about what? Leadership within the church. He's not talking about um, that there should be an inequality between men and women. Um, in Galatians, it addresses that, that in Christ, we're all equal. Um, it, it's not even saying that women aren't capable of spiritual leadership or aren't capable of even performing pastoral duties. Um, quite frankly, you know, I probably wasn't supposed to be there, but just in years of serving in camp ministry and being around and serving for ladies' conferences and so forth, I've heard ladies that can preach better than a lot of guys. It's just true, okay? And it's like, man, that was really, really well stated. They did really, really well with that. But yet, what is, what is God's plan for the church? It's that the, the, the men are to have the spiritual leadership. And so a couple of things that we need to understand as we look specifically here at this verse. Um, Paul really is echoing here 1 Peter 3, 4, but let your uh, adorning be the hidden person of the heart with imperishable, be imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Um, this gentle and this quiet spirit. And I think that's the heart of what we see here in 1 Timothy. It's it's the spirit, it's the attitude with which um, things are approached in the church. Um, the Greek word is uh, esukia, um, and I've rendered that quietness. Um, in some translations, it's rendered silence, but I, I don't think that that reflects the best sense of the word. Um, the usage in the New Testament does not always reflect that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean complete silence or no talking, okay? Um, it's used uh, elsewhere, and it has the idea to settle down, um, undisturbing, not unruly is the idea. Um, in fact, let's real quick look at another passage. Um, go with me over to the book of Acts, and we'll go to Acts 21. We'll just look at that real fast, and we'll see how this word is used. Um, if we pick up in verse 26, um, well, we can go down to 27. Paul here, this is after his third missionary journey. He's come back to Jerusalem. Several people have warned him not to go. I don't think it's going to go well for you in Jerusalem, Paul. And he says, you know what? I've got to go. 
And he's here, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw Paul in the temple, and he had gone there to worship there at the temple in Jerusalem. This is before it's destroyed in 70 AD. They, they saw him, and they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, and crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people, um, and, he, uh, and the law, and the place, and further, he hath brought the Greeks also into this temple, whether that was a true accusation or not, it was probably false, and hath polluted this holy place. Um, why did they make that accusation that they had seen him before? Uh, Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they drew him out of the temple, and forthwith, and the doors were shut. There's this huge commotion, okay? And the Jews are upset because Paul has been going to the Gentiles, and Paul has been doing all of these things, and they're stirring up the people. And all the city was moved, verse 30, and the people ran together. They take him out of the temple, and they went about to kill him. Okay, so this is a, a really raucous occasion here. Tidings came to the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, and that's never good when, you know, your precinct is, is losing it. Okay, the Romans don't like that. And he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down into them. And when they saw the chief captain of the soldiers, they left the beating of Paul. And the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him uh, to be bound with two chains. And then they're going to have this interaction. And finally, Paul says, look, I'm a Jew of Tarsus. This is verse 39. And he says, can I speak to the people? Okay, so is this a noisy scene or a quiet scene? I mean, this is just like chaos, right? And finally, in verse 1 of chapter 22, Paul begins addressing the crowd. My brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make unto you now. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept what? The more silence. Same word that we see in 1 Timothy. Um, and, and he saith, and he goes on with his, his speech. Okay, and so what do you have here? You have a change in the spirit of the crowd, okay? Because it's not absolute silence, right? Or you wouldn't have more of it. <laughs> There's a progressiveness here. The crowd is just in a crazy fervor. Finally, the Romans kind of settle them down a little bit. And then when Paul starts talking, boy, now they're kind of down to a low roar. And they're actually, they're kind of intentively listening. And it's an attitudinal um, type response. Um, we could go over to um, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. And it says that we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not as uh, busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Quietly in, in contrast with what? Being a busybody. Okay, having this just kind of gossipy, stirring up mentality. Okay, and so this, this uh, quietness, it's a, it's a spirit here. And so the sense here means settled down, undisturbed, not unruly. Um, Paul here is not demanding a physical silence that ladies never open their mouth and speak, but he's, he's commending a teachable spirit. And so... Um, some of these ladies, with the context of what they're saved out of, um, you know, maybe they had to, uh, you know, kind of speak up every time they had the opportunity. And he's saying, look, the context of the church is going to be different. I've, uh, it's God's plan that the men are, are leading and there's a certain teachable spirit that you would enter with. You kind of have to wonder if Paul didn't have in the back of his mind Proverbs 21, 19. It says it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman, okay? And so I think that's what he's addressing here. Don't, don't be that individual in the church that's stirring something up and that is uh, continually um, speaking out. And uh, verses 13 through 15, it's interesting. This is where the passage starts to get, um, if you will, a little bit dicey. You're like, what? What is going on here? What is this talking about? And he's going to uh, start encouraging their ambitions and their sources of affirmation and, and encouraging the ladies. In verse 13, it says, For Adam first was formed, then Eve. Verse 14, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman having been deceived into transgression came. Came into transgression because she was deceived. 
Um, and then this last curious verse, but she will be saved through the childbearing of children if they continue, if that is the ladies, that these, these moms and wives continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Okay, so let's just unpack this because this is actually, um, most, most scholars agree, this is one of the most difficult set of verses to interpret in all of the New Testament. And so, hence probably why my professor assigned them for this wonderful project that I'm working on, all right? But it's good, it's good to work through this. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we get the attitude thing. Uh, I get that it's about our heart, not our external. But then you have to bring up this whole Adam and Eve thing. I mean, what's going on here, Paul? What is going on? Well, um, why is the idea of, 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 uh, of women accepting spiritual leadership of men and learning with a spirit of quietness as it references over in 1 Peter 3, 4, I ref referenced this earlier. Why is that something that is precious in God's sight, it says? And it ties into the truth that it, that it, it manifests an understanding and an acceptance of his design for the human race. Okay, so this is God's intent from the beginning. And we, we did a, uh, I think it was a Sunday night on... Um, this was a while back, and I can't remember if we referenced it or we did a whole study, but it was on work, okay, and, and how God has put it within the heart of man to work, and that is fulfilling to him, right? And sometimes we have this misconception that work was a part of the fall, okay, and they, the world was plunged into sin, and now Adam and Eve and all generations afterwards, they're cursed with all of this hard work, right? But that wasn't it at all. Because God put Adam into, to what? To tend the garden. You realize that work was something that was part of what God said, this is good. So had there been no fall, guess what? We would work every day at something. And that's part of God's design. And it's part of God's design for fulfillment in our life. And so here, Paul is bringing them back and saying, look, this whole this whole concept, it may be difficult at times to accept or understand, but it's not that this is part of the fall and that this is just part of the fallout of sin. This is part of God's original intent. He created Adam. He saw everything was good. And then he said, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. And so he created Eve, a help meet for him. And this was part of the design for the family, for the marriage relationship um, from the beginning of uh, creation. And so Paul here based his view of male-female relationships in the church on the account of creation recorded in Genesis 2. Um, he, he made no reference to the so-called curse of Genesis 3.16. Rather here, the roles that Paul spells out are a product of God's fundamental design where an Adam was formed first and then Eve. It was part of God's intent. And then it says this curious verse, right? But she will be saved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Now, let's, let's re revisit real fast a verse that I realized I just skipped over. What is this talking about when it says, an Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression? It, he's just speaking to that fact that um, it was God's plan for Adam to lead, and, and Eve, at that moment, stepped out from the leadership, began doing things on her own, and it's interesting how the fall played out because it says that Eve was deceived by the serpent. In other words, she thought, if I eat this, it's going to make me wise, it's going to make me like a god. Adam and his spiritual leadership, or lack thereof, comes up and realizes that's not going to do a thing for Eve. And what does he do in the lack of his spiritual leadership at that moment? He knowingly sins, and it's still sin. It's, it's, he's not deceived at all by it, but he willfully disobeys God. And wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. And because Adam sinned, we're all sinners. And so, He's, he's stating that, look, this, this was from the beginning. It's not because of the fall. This was God's intent. Look right off the bat when things got out of whack with this, 
how it affected Eve, how it affected Adam. And so make sure that you keep this in balance, especially within the context of the church. Now, the really, the really difficult verse, but she will be saved through the bearing of children. Why is it difficult? Because the word saved there, and I'll just tell you, it's just our Sunday night gravel. You can handle this. It's the idea of uh, like a, a soteriological concept. Um, it is like a salvation, like saved from sin. And that's why we wrestle with it. Because you think, what is going on? Does that mean that if someone doesn't have children, they're not going to heaven? And so you see kind of the, the consternation that this verse would evoke, right? What does it mean she, she will be saved through the bearing of children? Well, if you, if you really plummet this, you see a, a couple of different truths that, that come up. One, Paul's point here, and especially in the context of the previous verse, is that while a woman may have been involved in leading the human race into sin, women have the privilege of leading the race out of sin to godliness. Okay, who is it that has the primary influence of children in the home? It's mom, okay? And are dads to be the spiritual leaders? Sure. But when it's all said and done, who is there really nurturing and bringing up those children if they're going to head towards God and the things of Christ? It's the mom. And so that's referenced in this verse, that salvation is there for the children. The other component of this is not just the, um, the idea of, of, of forgiveness of sins. It, it really is misleading to stop there. Um, but there is the, the nuance, there's the concept of the affirmation, the uh, fulfillment um, in life. Okay, so how does the world get this all out of balance, right? The world says for, for ladies, you know what? Um, that whole marriage thing, that's overrated. Don't you worry about having kids till you're 44. You go out there and make something of yourself. You, you be the domineering leader. You speak up, okay, this whole feminist movement. And this was surfacing what, apparently even in Paul's day. And even as people were saved out of kind of a pagan society, this was infiltrating into the church. And so Paul is saying, hey, would you realize that if you'll step back and you'll trust what God's plan was for the marriage relationship, for the home, and what it's also for in the context of the worship service, that this is where a, a lady really can find true fulfillment. And the idea here is that a woman will find her greatest satisfaction and meaning in life, not in seeking and usurping the male role, but in fulfilling God's design for her as a wife and mother. And what are the, 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 um, the, the things that kind of help all of this come together? It is her daily living. If it is in with faith and love and holiness with propriety or self-restraint. And so it's probably another message of itself. And so if you're ever wanting to do a, a ladies Bible study and you dare look to this passage, you can say the, um, you know, the keys to successful womanhood, faith, love, holiness, and self-control. All right. And, and Paul kind of lays it out there. There's more you could study in that. Um, but anyway, this is a, this is a delicate passage. It's a difficult passage, but when you, when you kind of put it all together, I think you see the heart of Paul in encouraging Timothy and encouraging the ladies and the church at Ephesus. Real quick, some implications, and we'll wrap up tonight. And then I probably shouldn't, but I will take questions, I guess, if you guys have something that you're curious about. Two, two implications I'd like to look at. One, for men, um, this passage, it really ought to make us feel the weight and responsibility of spiritual leadership within the home, and within the church. Um, men, I think we could readily admit that there are too few men that are leading spiritually. There's a lack of um, a, a quality, a caliber of spiritual leadership from our men, and that's something that we ought to step up to and step into that role uh, for the sake of our wives, for the sake of our families. And, and this passage really kind of hammers that home on us. It doesn't get, let us off the hook, does it? For ladies, um, be careful of adopting the world's opinions in regard to appearance, in regard to attitudes and worship, in regard to ultimately seeking fulfillment 
in God's distinctive role for ladies within the church and within the home. Because what will happen, just as in Paul's day, the ideas, the philosophies of this world system begin to infiltrate not only our thinking, but in our churches. And so let's be cautious of that. All right, well, hopefully that was a fair treatment of the text. Um, any questions tonight that pop in your head or that you felt was really unclear or just that you had a question about? Yes, Kelsey. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, um, and, and I think even within the context of the home, I mean, you want to be careful if you have if you have a, um, you know, a small group within the church. Um, from passages like this and others, should the lady be the primary teacher of that mixed group meeting together on a regular basis? And I would say probably not. If you're having a ladies Bible study in your home, I mean, um, it says, the, uh, let the elder women teach the younger. Let um, the women teach their children. The, the Bible makes no prohibition on the ladies teaching or teaching others or encouraging others spiritually. Or, I mean, you look at other passages and it talks about what? The edification of the body. And there's ladies in the body of Christ. There's men in the body of Christ. And so, you know, I think if, if you... If you work through the appearance and attitudes portion, I mean, you're going to be coming and encouraging another man with the right spirit and the right heart, whether it's your husband or someone else in the church. Now, you have to, of course, be careful with all, navigating all of that. But do you see, you see how that kind of fits together? Does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, well, you know, I, whenever it's a, a gospel question, I always go back to Romans 1.16. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And I think one of the things that you um, have to, and I'll, you, you asked a fair question, so I'm going to give you a fairly kind of blunt answer, and, and please don't take it the wrong way or sense it as an accusation or anything, but just let's put it all out there, right? What's going to save that individual is the gospel not an emotional relationship. And that's where you have to keep the, the boundaries because, you know, your, your primary, uh, you know, relationship is to your husband. And so can you answer questions about the truth of the gospel? Yeah. But if it develop, starts to develop into that emotional relationship, that's where it's getting out of balance because that's not what's going to save him. It's not your persuasiveness or that ultimate you know, time with him. It's, it's, it's what the word of God says about the gospel. And so, you know, if you start to ever sense that, okay, this is out of balance. I mean, if, if God's at work in his heart for the sake of the gospel, there's never anything wrong with saying, well, you know what? Uh, my husband's off on two, Thursday morning. Why don't you guys go out and have coffee and he can tell you more about this. <laughs> and you'll probably find out really, really quick what the interest is, is truly in. And if, if there's a, a heart and a hunger for what does the word of God say, he'll say, sure, yeah, that'd be awesome. Can you set that up for us? Or, oh, okay. And then, you know, you maybe you want to be cautious there. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Good questions. Anything else? Oh, I'm sure people do, and I, I would imagine like, oh, yeah. No, because I I go back. It would be hard for me to argue it from this passage, and I would get that people would. But going back to that infinitive in the Greek, um, to set yourself in order, and and then you know you look at other passages where there is that positive light of being adorned and. Um, you know, even, I mean, this is a little little out there, but, uh, you know, there, it, the, the Word of God talks of bejeweled cities. I mean, even heaven. Okay, jewels are not, uh, 
a negative connotation in, in God's economy. Um, now, can that be, you know, taken to an extreme and inappropriate and that kind of thing? Well, sure. I mean, we all realize that and know that. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't see that that's here in this passage. Yeah, does that help? Other questions? Samantha, Laura, did you guys get all that? All right. <laughs> okay. Well, let's close in prayer tonight and uh, appreciate y'all uh, navigating this study with us this evening. Father, thank you so much for your word. And uh, God, thank you that your word does have answers. And Lord, help us to um, be willing and open to the truths of your word. And even when we come to uh, passages that sometimes we can think of as, as delicate or even challenging, um, help us to be understanding of them and help us by your Holy Spirit um, to have um, illumination to understand and also uh, the grace to apply. And Lord, help us um, to be gracious with others. We would realize that um, there would be um, certainly people in the community that would disagree with us on some of these things. And in some cases, um, other Christians and other believers. And so help us to be graceful with um, even where we may have had a study that others have not. And Lord, to be patient in that realm. And uh, God, that you would just help us to follow uh, your intent for um, our marriages, for our homes, and for the church. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.
Stop for what? What? Well, someone's watching us. <laughs> 